Very good morning. Anthony Chung here, the Head of Market Analysis at Amplified Trading. It is Thursday the 18th of June, so I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching the briefing there. Uh, we have my daily macro updates. You've got Sam's weekly look ahead on a technical analysis perspective, and then Eddie's kind of deep dive into some of the major macro themes that he releases over the weekend. And also, if you would like updates during the day, just generally insights and useful infographics and things of that nature, then uh, check out my Twitter handle below. Uh, but looking at the charts this morning, and, and as you can see here, I've got a prepared map of coronavirus in the US, but let's just jump to the charts first and have a look at how sentiment uh, is at the European Open. And fairly, I'd say fairly flat, perhaps, ever so moderately negative in the overnight session following generally the lower close that we had on Wall Street, continuation of focus on going on some of the corona kind of hot spots, particularly in North America, but also still monitoring in China. Uh, and that has led to then a dip that we saw uh, into the back end of Wall Street's session, and then that kind of continuation that we saw uh, into the Asia Pacific trading hours. You can see here the S&P just forming a bit of a bottom uh, at around what is respectively the S2 on the day and that coinciding with around that spike low that we had given some of the volatility that was seen a bit earlier in the week. Uh, we have so since recovered so despite quite a lot of the headlines they almost feel like they're retrospective in a sense that they're looking back and they're talking about the virus but you know, looking at the charts this morning, it almost feels like the, the market's already over that to a certain extent. Uh, and kind of looking now at this chart, I mean, I'm just looking at the S&P here. You know, it does feel like we're we're relatively range bound at the moment, uh, and that kind of dictated by then the ellipses here at the top and at the bottom. So so right now we're kind of right in the middle of that range for the time being. So elsewhere. I mean, gold was ticking a little higher through Asia Pacific hours, but it has backed off to a certain extent, uh, just given some of the, the, the pickup that we've had in equities. A uh, bit choppy here more recently, but a trend line I've just had on uh, over the last couple of days going back to the, the 14th, uh, the reopening of trade that we had, and relatively well in terms of its holding, but again, I'm just kind of conscious of this range high area uh, that's just kind of capping some of the price activity uh, over the course of the last couple of days, really, this week, which is more around the 391740 type mark. Um, and then in the currency markets, the Dixie is a touch softer, uh, and again, in fitting with the fact that um, it's seen a bit of up and down movement, but all in all, then the major pairs uh, just ever so slightly higher. The, the sterling currency obviously awaiting the Bank of England rate decision, uh, not really looking too interesting at this point, if anything. Uh, again, kind of similar in extent of a, of a near-term upside uh, constrained by a trend line and, and resistance from some of the highs that we were seeing in late US or late London hours last night and the Asia Pacific session. Uh, oil markets, again, the, the correlation here with equities is still relatively tight in regard to the, the two moving in tandem. And so finding a bit of resistance near term at the pivot level. So people not really getting too phased by the infantry data. There really was, wasn't too much in it, to be quite honest, uh, yesterday. Uh, and from what we've seen from the APIs and the DOEs, it's been uh, largely ignored. Uh, and I think quite rightly so. I think there's bigger, uh, more clear present risks on the demand side with the tracking and, and the ebb and flow of people's confidence about the second wave virus and its potential impact. Uh, what it would have consequently on energy products than it is on these these kind of short term uh, infantry numbers which albeit are not really that far away removed from expectations with those numbers that we've seen this week so yeah just having a look then equity markets as i said just seeing a bit of a pickup so you know one of the main things i'd suggest here is just being quite um, objective in your your analysis and not get, getting too influenced by kind of mainstream media, which is definitely kind of jumping on the, the bandwagon a little bit about uh, the COVID situation. Because looking at the charts this morning, you know, as I speak right now, equities are ticking higher, gold's ticking lower, and T notes are moving lower. And so this would all be indicative of more risk appetite than it would be 
of um, people getting spooked at this point. So despite the dip yesterday, it's been a fairly similar pattern to what we've had really the last couple of sessions. You know, we had back on, um, what, two days ago? So on Tuesday, we had that rally, then quite an aggressive dip and recovery. It's almost like the same now. Uh, yesterday's session, a dip and recovery before then a fall quite late and then a repeat once again. So at the moment, I think the market is trying to, as I've said all this week, weigh up the, the prospect of um, tracking the virus against then uh, the phenomenal response that we've seen from central banks and, in, and stimulus measures from, from governments. And so we're kind of respecting a relative period of consolidation for the time being. And I think you've got to um, tie that into then your strategy and approach for the day, whereby then it's probably not the most appropriate thing to just be looking for big, outright, clean directional moves at this point where the market is in somewhat uh, of, a, of a status quo until we see something new uh, development on one of those bigger major themes. So let's have a look at a couple of the headlines and get you up to speed. So what is the deal with the corona situation at the moment? Well, uh, this is coronavirus uh, in the US, the latest map count. So just looking at the US here in terms of cases and then the seven day average, which you can see is seeing a slight uptick here in the most recent days. And if we were looking at the hotspots in the United States over uh, a two week period, uh, quite familiar to what we've been looking at over the last week, predominantly as the south, the southeast, but namely Texas in particular, uh, Florida. But if you were to go further uh, to the northwest, then looking at around Oregon region as well, uh, that's seen a bit of a flare up in cases of late. Uh, so again, looking at the trajectory of these key areas, uh, obviously Texas, Florida, uh, Arizona, Alabama are some of the areas that are seeing the most steepest inclines um, and probably warrant the ones that are worth tracking when uh, typically London time we start to see the, the daily kind of update um, and percentage increment changes at around half past three London time is when they, they generally have been hitting the news wires. Uh, Texas reported 11% surge in hospitalizations, uh, which was the biggest 24 hour increase since the 4th of June. Uh, Texas reported a 3.4% jump in new cases yesterday, exceeding the seven-day average uh, of 2.7%. Florida um, was up 3.3% from a day earlier, comparative to the seven-day average of 28 So those two areas uh, are kind of the, the, the focus points at the moment. On a national level, the 1.2% increase, so we're looking here and back to the original, uh, was in line with the daily average increase uh, really of around 1.1% over the past seven days. So looking at uh, away from some of those hotspots on a national scale, um, it is relatively in line. Um, what has Trump said? Well, as you would expect, Trump saying that coronavirus will fade away even without a vaccine. So obviously this is completely as expected. He's going to come out and try to defend the situation. Uh, he said we're very close to a vaccine. We're very close to therapeutics, really good therapeutics, of course, uh, quoting him. Um, and that was on a Fox News uh, television interview that he did yesterday evening. So, yeah, Trump's really got his work cut out at the minute because, you know, just before I go on to, to Trump and some of the difficulties he's facing politically at the moment, um, I don't want to talk just one side of the book here. Um, yes, Florida, Texas... Uh, are looking are looking quite, uh, I guess, challenging from a control of the coronavirus situation. But there's some other areas that have been a little bit better. New York City, which was one of the outbreaks epicenters when you think about uh, North America, uh, they're actually moving still toward um, additional reopening next week. Um, elsewhere, you've had Germany, the coronavirus infection rate uh, fell to 0 0.86 on the kind of R value, and that's the lowest in a week. Um, so there's a bit of a mixed situation at the moment. Um, you know, Africa is not looking good at the minute. Neither is Brazil. Uh, China, Beijing cases exceeded now 150, given that outbreak in that market earlier in the week. And that now is the worst outbreak since the actual original situation uh, back in the beginning of the year in, um, in Wuhan. So there's a few areas here which are a little bit conflicting. Um, I guess, though, the, the one that the market is kind of most interested in 
such as how markets operate uh, is not so much tracking, let's say, quite frightening levels of growth of the virus in uh, the African continent, but more so in North America, um, just given the, the overwhelming focus on the US economic kind of situation. Um, but yeah, as I said, Trump does have his hands full at the minute because not only is he trying to um, control the narrative on the virus, Trump has been accused <laughs> by the former national security advisor Bolton of breaking the law uh, with tell all memoir. Now, uh, this is re really interesting actually. So what's happened here is uh, John Bolton, as I said, the former national security advisor, which Trump effectively fired uh, not that long ago, he's, he published part of his memoir in Wall Street Journal. Uh, and apparently it said that Trump has asked China's leader Xi Jinping during a G20 summit in Japan last year to help him win a re-election by buying more US farm goods. Um, Trump apparently also encouraged Xi um, to build detention camps uh, in a certain province in Zhejiang region to imprison hundreds of thousands of, of Chinese Muslims. So, so, yeah, I mean, this obviously politically we're in a we're in an election year now and it's all to kind of play for in the months ahead and this is certainly going to be a bit of a blow for him to tackle so you, as you can imagine he's probably going to be tweeting like nobody's business at the moment and actually i'm just looking at my my tweet deck right now um trump was tweeting two hours ago about wacko john bolton i mean that literally is his tweet uh and you know if he is stateside which i assume he is uh, at the moment, I mean, God, what time is it? And he's tweeting at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you're going to get a lot more of that at the moment as he looks to do his normal kind of tactic of distraction and you know, kind of uh, fake news and all this type of thing. But interestingly, what the politics is suggesting here is that obviously Trump's trying to play the strong hand against China, but then this would suggest that actually he's kind of in cahoots with Xi to get a re-election and look, buy the US farm goods. And so, you know, is it all a bit of a front? And if that is found to be the case, that's probably going to be detrimental to the kind of narrative he's trying to spin with the kind of the, the, the arm wrestling he's doing at the moment in a more aggressive sense uh, with China uh, in terms of public perception. The other thing here then is obviously the human rights issue about how a uh, certain uh, sect of, of, of the Islamic faith are being treated these Chinese Muslims in the in the west of the country, uh, and you know the U.S. have been quite standoffish on that. But obviously, that's a that's a, a big issue on on an international and in a developed world sense. And so, yeah, if he's if he appears to be encouraging that type of activity, which obviously China are very sensitive to, but that also he would probably be condemned very heavily on that type of action. So, yeah, quite interesting to see this unfold. And I was having a look at the. Uh, Real Clear Politics or RCP, which is kind of that main service that's going to come into focus throughout the next coming months because it kind of aggregates all of the polls of polls. And the RCP average at the moment has Biden now clear by about eight and a half points. Uh, and, and, you know, just been looking at it here since really the last month or so. Uh, and obviously the kind of reality bites on the economic situation from COVID um, and now you know, questionable re um, remarks about the actual virus, but now this latest episode as well, you know, Biden at the moment is, is clear favourite. I mean, I'm not sure I, I buy into polls quite as clear as um, suggesting that this is what's going to be the case at this point in time. But, um, you know, Trump has got his work cut out here to try and just get back on an even keel to, to some respect. Um, moving on, a couple of Brexit related headlines. These aren't really moving the pound this morning. Um, do note you've got the Bank of England later, which will, will take precedence because none of these Brexit comments are particularly new, but just getting you up to speed. Um, the European Commission President um, van der Leyen signalled that the EU would be willing to compromise on its demands over fishing and the role in its courts in any post-Brexit trade deal, but did warn the bloc is not prepared to sacrifice its principles for the sake of an agreement. So yeah, perhaps a little bit of compromise on both sides we've seen emerge over the last week and that would mean then that the transition extension request at the end of the month is looking increasingly unlikely and as per that um, 
discussed timeline from yesterday, looking at potential then for an August type deal and, and maybe then by autumn, October time at an EU summit uh, to get kind of sign off on a, on a very basic level uh, trade agreement. Um, on that point of Brexit, uh, Boris Johnson, UK Prime Minister, is meeting uh, his French counterpart Macron to meet um, with Brexit trade talks, a key phase at the moment. Um, so you're probably going to get some commentary hit the wires as well today. Uh, could it be market moving? I don't think so. Um, probably just bringing this to your attention so you don't get spooked by any headlines as they come out. Uh, Macron's probably been the most resistant to showing any type of weakness or, or compromise over the Brexit issue. So if anything, um, I'm sure they will be um, perfectly professional to one another in a political open public sense. But I don't think that you know, the, the, the red lines will be firm as far as both of these two characters are concerned at this point in time, I would imagine. With the Bank of England, um, the Bank of England, today we are expecting an extension of their quantitative easing program. Uh, the kind of base expectation here is an increase of £100 billion. So anything short of that certainly would be a disappointment. Uh, there are a couple of banks, uh, Nomura ING being two, which are looking for 150. I even heard City um, was seeing or calling for 200 billion. So it's a little bit of a spread, but the bulk looking for 100. The ones who are looking for slightly more are talking about the fact that that allows them, the Bank of England, don't forget every month they're purchasing a certain amount of that allotted cap. And so the bigger the cap, then the longer they can commit to then. Um, doing these this, these QE purchases without having to then go over this whole kind of forward guidance again. It buys them enough time at 150 to basically continue purchases at the rate that they're doing until around early October. And hopefully at that point then they've got more clarity about the current state of the economy, the current state of what COVID-19 looks like and, and so on. So it would make a lot of sense. Uh, in terms of the reaction here, um, remember, what, two weeks ago or so, when the ECB announced an over-delivery of $100 billion on their um, PEPP program, um, we did see actually the euro rally, which is almost a counterintuitive move. Um, but um, again, it's to do with the fact that it's going to propel the speed and shape of the economic recovery, and that's seen as a positive factor for, for uh, given the, the bleak economic situation globally that we face. So I'd probably be anticipating a similar type of action. If they over-deliver the Bank of England and go for, say, a 200 increase, uh, then certainly I think you, you could see some upside there in the British pound. But again, 100 is probably the base case here. Um, in terms of economic evidence uh, in the UK, I don't think it really points to the idea of, of negative rates. Market pricing doesn't really see that anyway uh, until... You know, way further out down the timeline, uh, only one of 43 economists surveyed see negative rates at the Bank of England uh, by year end. So that's definitely not on the on the agenda right now. And as per the negative rate debate that kind of ended a couple of weeks ago after it was, you know, kind of the talk of the town. No one's really mentioning it at the moment. And that's reflected in market expectations. Um, one possibility I have read is that the Bank of England could lower the rate on its TFS, its term lending or term funding scheme, which helps banks provide much needed credit to companies because that's where really you can assist a lot more direct uh, the current um, situation would be more beneficial. It's not so much helping the, let's say, commercial bank sector, but helping actually companies get access to credit on the ground, which then has a knock-on effect in their ability to be able to keep people employed and so on and so forth. So yeah, the Bank of England coming up, um, you know, we'll, we'll be covering it live, of course, but yeah, it's not, I don't really see it being a huge event, uh, to be quite honest, but, but obviously we'll be quite keen to watch it when it comes out. Um, and then in terms of the calendar for today, uh, what have we got? Well, the morning is pretty quiet, uh, the Bank of England midday, and then you've got the weekly initial jobless claims from the US, and it's kind of a continuation generally of the trend, it's still in the million type figure at the moment but slowly decreasing in terms of initial jobless um, and you've also got the Philly Fed Business Index as well this afternoon so both those figures coming out at 1.30. Uh, you've also got the JMMC meeting so the Joint um, Ministerial Monitoring Committee and uh, this is to do with then you know how are that OPEC plus agreement which obviously they rolled over an additional month 
just a week or so ago. How is that going? What are the compliance levels looking like? And actually, that's quite important because you remember Saudi Arabia for one uh, and also getting Russia on board to agree it was all contingent that countries were kind of stepping up their game and becoming more compliant, particularly countries like Iraq, for example. So uh, I'd be quite interested to see um, as and when those comments come out. From a speaker perspective, um, this morning ECB's de Guindos hasn't said anything so far um, and should be speaking shortly. Uh, Bank of England's Broadbent is going to be speaking with Tenreiro um, one neutral, one dovish person partaking in a panel discussion on the regulation of households, so not so much on policy directly. And just given the um, the fact that the Bank of England meeting is happening um, at midday, it's unlikely that they're going to say anything. Uh, fixed income wise, some supply coming out of Spain and France this morning uh, to be aware of. Uh, and that's it. So if you have any questions, please do let me know. Um, happy to help as and when I can. Uh, and as I said, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. There's, there's plenty more videos coming, and including those over the weekend from, from the team, Eddie and, and Sam as well. Okay, guys, have a good day, and I'll catch you tomorrow. Thanks very much.